I'm just uh, thankful to be able to, to speak in front of you today. I asked God, when I found out I was going to be here and doing this, I asked God, what, what do you want me to speak on? And normally, I get up here and I will preach on a passage, because I'm really big on what they call exegetical preaching. That is where you take a passage, uh, one verse, maybe 10 verses, and you go through it exactly one, one verse at a time and preach what the Word says, and, and that. I like that. Today is not going to be that. Today I'm bouncing all over the place, um, because I want to talk about, God said, talk about a testimony, okay? Your testimony is your story of how God brought you from death to life. Now, everybody's story is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to steal this a little bit from Matt uh, Loftus, and Matt's the only guy who I know of that has a purple suit. But uh, he was up here preaching or singing. He gave a message. It's interesting. I, I told um, Ryan that I was going to teach on testimony about two or three weeks ago. And then Matt, I told Matt, and Matt goes, oh, well, I'm preaching on testimonies too. And, uh, and Ryan is going to have his daughter give a testimony, I think, here in a couple, three weeks or something like that. But anyway... God is speaking testimony to a lot of people right now, and I want to just go through the idea of what it takes to have a testimony. How do you put your testimony together? And so I kind of went through, and I found some Bible verses, and we'll talk about those in a moment, uh, that talk about testimonies. But I want to just go through the points of a testimony, okay? And the number one thing that you've got to do, and I don't know how to say this in a nice way, but you've got you, you, you got to earn the right to share your testimony. Is that right? Now, there may be opportunities where you can just, out of the blue, witness to Jesus Christ in a situation. But to really get down and share your testimony, you got to build some kind of a relationship with who you're sharing with. Look for some commonality kind of thing. That might be a job. It might be a hobby. If if I'm going to share testimony with you, I'm probably going to talk about running somewhere in there, or radio, or who knows what. But uh, or even music. Uh, music has been one of my common themes for me. But you establish that point of reference where you've got some sort of commonality with who you're sharing with. And then you move from that into the story of your old life. Now, that for some, that might be a lengthy process. But I'd say for most of us, you can keep it fairly short. You don't really have to glorify sin, right? And my life, I'm going to give an example of all this at the end, so just hang in there. But uh, the point to get to is the problem. That's That's the third thing. We are all lost at some point, right? We're all lost. And you got to, that's the part of the story where you tell someone how you discovered the truth of salvation. Sometimes you have to go over this several times with somebody before they get it. Sometimes you, you know, I, for me, it took a long time for me to get from the point of, of, thinking I was okay, to knowing that I wasn't okay, to knowing what to do to get okay, 
it took a while. And, and not everybody gets it the first time through. So be patient. And the number one thing that you share is that somehow you finally got to get it through their head that they are not enough in and of themselves to get to heaven. Once they reach that point, once you can get somebody to that point, you have a, you have a little door that's opened. When they finally realize, whoa, I can't do this on my own. And you provide the, the solution. Step four. Now, almost everybody, really, almost everybody that I know of, thinks they're good enough to go to heaven. I mean, didn't you, before you got saved, didn't you think, well, you know, I'm probably good enough. You know, I, I won't know until I get up there and Peter's at the gate and he'll decide if I get in or not. Not true, by the way, theologically. <laughs> but, uh, you know, almost everybody thinks they're good enough to go to heaven. I grew up in a, in a church that that's pretty much all they taught me was, well, if you're good enough and you don't do too many bad things and you go get yourself baptized, then you'll, you'll go to heaven. And I found out that was not true. You know, and in our world today, if you've ever been to a, a funeral of somebody that you know was not a Christian, they still, almost everybody thinks everybody's going to heaven, right? They're all going to go to a better place, going to be in a better place. <sighs> but somehow, this is where you provide the problem, but you also provide the solution. Uh, no one is good enough to go to heaven on their own. I heard a testimony of uh, a pastor who said he often did this on airplanes because people sitting beside you always wanted to talk occasionally. So he would uh, eventually get around to what he did, and, and then they would talk about God and their belief that they were good enough or that kind of thing. And he'd often use this scale. He'd say, okay, let's, let's take a look at it from this angle. Say you've got this scale of goodness. And let's, and he would just arbitrarily say, let's put Mother Teresa up here at the top, close to the top of this scale. And we're going to put Hitler down here at the bottom of the scale. And we're going to put Billy Graham in here about three quarters of the way up and everything. Where, where do you think you fit in to that? He would ask them and Invariably, they would kind of put themselves somewhere around the middle. Somewhere around the middle. Not too good, not too bad. And then, he would say, Now, I hate to tell you this, but God is about a mile higher than Mother Teresa. You can't get there by being in the middle. The only way you go to heaven is Jesus is the elevator to get you up to God, right? On this, on this scale. This is, he would use that. He takes you to the top floor. But, and here's step five in your testimony, but it's not automatic. Being a human being is not enough, although God loves human beings above all other creation, really. We're made in his image. We are speaking spirits. Keep that in mind. Nothing else in this world has a spirit that connects to God because we're made in his image, right? But being human is not enough. And unfortunately for many of you, and me too, being an American is not enough either. We think of America as a Christian nation, or we used to at least, and everybody thought, well, everybody in America is a Christian. And being a church member is not enough either. 
And even being baptized is not enough. I remember getting baptized when I was 11, somewhere around in there. And to show you how, uh, how saved I was or how much I really loved God, I was trying to peek through the, uh, the keyhole to see the girls in the other room. Yeah. I really knew what I was doing. <laughs> Peter said in Acts, repent and believe. He said, repent and be baptized. Uh, but it was, if you really know what baptism was in the New Testament, baptism was not a membership into the church like we've changed it into. Baptism was your confession of faith. It was how you showed the rest of the world that you believed in Jesus. And in fact, when Paul says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Jesus and Lord, kurios Christu, was what they said when they went under, just before they went under. And they would say that, and then they would baptize them. They'd come up. And that's, that's kind of a side note, but I'm just saying, that is where we've got to get people from point A to point B and help them understand that that's the, uh, the point. All right, I only have three pages here, so we're, we're going to get through this fairly quick. But salvation, and this is probably the last step in terms of, of a testimony, is this. Salvation involves a decision, right? And that's where you have to get the person that you're giving your testimony to. Show them that there is a point of decision. You are created in God's image, which means you have a free will. We have a sovereign God, but that sovereign God has self-limited himself for the sake of love because what is love if you, don't, if you can't choose not to love? You have to choose to believe or not to believe. That determines your final destiny. destiny and that's what your testimony is really about. Sharing your story of how, that, how you were led into that life-changing decision. With that said, I want to look at a, a few scriptures. I want to show you a couple of things. Paul gave his testimony a couple of different times. Actually, the story of his salvation is, is in Acts chapter 9. And I want to go to that, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And then Paul repeats this two other times, sharing it with uh, others. So it's a kind of a classic example. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Paul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest and he got letters to go to Damascus and arrest him. That was, that's in there. But verse, jump down to, uh, to verse 32. I'm sorry. Verse 3. 3 and 6. 3 to 6. And he approached Damascus and a light from heaven shone around him. Verse 4, And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now, get up and go to the city, and you'll be told what you need to do. Well, what did he get told? What was he told? Verse, 30, uh, verse 8, Saul picked himself up off the ground. When he opened his eyes, he was blind. He was told by Ananias that God wanted to heal him and of the blindness that he had and that he gave him, to give his life to the Lord. Well, he got up, and his eyes were opened, and he began to witness, if you follow the, the passage there, and he retells that story twice. But he goes through that whole thing of, hey, here's what, I was, here's what I was in the past. Here's what happened to me. I found out I needed Jesus. Somebody came and prayed with me. 
and my life was changed. He followed that pattern. You know, some, a couple other things I want to just point out. There wasn't anybody around necessarily to uh, record all these things, but in Matthew chapter 9, you have the story of the woman who came up while Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house. The woman comes up, and she's got the issue of blood, and she says, oh man, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'd be healed. And so in Matthew chapter 9, that story is related there. But if you look over in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus is in a totally different place. And all these people came out. He came off the, the lake and he landed in Gennesaret or wherever it was. And all these people came out and wanted to be healed. And as many as touched the hem of his, even the touched the hem of his garment were healed. That means that lady went around and told everybody. There were people in that world that knew that that's all they needed was that little tiny little bit of faith. And the same thing, I think it's interesting too that the, uh, the Gadarene demoniac, he, uh, you know, he's the one that Jesus cast out the legion of demons that, into the swine. And when the people saw him, they were amazed because he was sitting in his right mind with his clothes on. And when it was time for Jesus to leave, he begged him, I want to go with you. And Jesus said, nope, you stay here and you go tell your family and your friends all that God has done for you. And that's what he did. So, with that said, I want to give you just a little bit of my testimony. I grew up in the Midwest, in the state of Iowa, uh, but it was much like this area. I lived in a small town, little town of Sheraton, and pretty much had small town values. Uh, I grew up in a family that went to church, um, and I thought I was, you know, living a pretty good life. So... I went through, you know, got through high school, but I had a problem with uh, pride. I'd say that's probably was my biggest issue as a teenager because I found out, you know, hey, I'm smarter than some of the other people, and I got good grades and those kind of things, and I had more than one person tell me I was kind of conceited, and uh Hopefully, I'm not that way anymore. <laughs> Maybe my wife was one of them. I don't know. <laughs> kind of thing. But uh, I remember being in a, in, in a situation. I, I didn't grow up in, a, in an evangelical church. I didn't grow up in a town that had very many evangelical churches. We had a lot of mainstream churches. And then I went to one of those. And honestly, I was never told that I needed any sort of forgiveness of sins and, and through uh, accepting Jesus Christ, you just became a member of the church is basically all you did. You went through uh, a class, membership class, and then you walked down front and the pastor asked you, uh, do you believe in Jesus? And what else are you going to say when you're down front with five other kids? He's, yes. Yeah. And then you got baptized. And that was it. Uh, there wasn't any change in my life or anything like that. When I was a junior in high school, my sister started dating a, a Christian boy, uh, and uh, I started palling around with some of the some of him and some of his friends, and uh, began that short little process of seeing. There was a difference between me and these these boys, and that went to uh, this little um, gosh, I can't even remember the name of it now. White Breast Christian Christian Union Church. That was it. And so, I had a couple of times in my life. There was one I went to that church once when I was a sophomore to hear my sister sing. She was in a trio of girls. And they were singing that night. And I remember that guy 
preached a sermon, and I was on the back row, and there were probably were fingerprints in the pew in front of me because I was hanging on tight because it felt like he was, as I was under conviction, I'll be quite honest with you, uh, because I felt like I was back there, it was like he was, there's this boy in the back row that needs to get saved tonight, and you know who you are. I mean, that's his, you know, that's what it felt like. And I resisted. I didn't do anything. I remember I dated a Christian girl, went to the Nazarene church. I would go to my church on Sunday morning and go to her church on Sunday night. And they had someone come in, evangelist came in with a revival one week. And I remember also being under very strong conviction during that revival. But I didn't want to do it in front of Vicky, you know, so I resisted. And it wasn't until I was at work. I worked at High V at the time. Uh, I was the guy that, that built all the displays of all the sale items every week. We had to, uh, you know, all the, the big, I made can stacks, believe it or not. We stacked cans in a certain way and never had a can stack fall over on me, which is good. But uh, we, uh, we had to build those displays. And, but there were other guys that were in charge of this aisle or that aisle or whatever. And there was a guy named Jim Corkery. And Jim Corkery was, um, I think he was, and, and I don't say this in a mean sense or anything like that, but I believe he was a child that was the result of a rape. His mother was raped, and, um, and he was adopted by a family there in Sheraton. And Jim, somewhere during his senior year, found Jesus. And I could, even, even as blind as I was, I could see there was a difference. I could see a big difference. And, and Jim would sometimes talk to me in the grocery store. And if, I, I was going to mention this earlier, but Matt had his message. He talked about pickup lines uh, and how you witness to people and how the woman at the well had a pickup line. He told me everything I've ever done. Uh, the woman who touched his garment, hey, I touched his tassel and I was healed. Um, Jim Corkery gave me the verse Matthew 16, 25. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Well, at the time, that's what I was doing. I was working six, I think I had one day off. I was, I was even working on Sundays, uh, trying to make as much money as I could so I could go to college and I was headed to Iowa State University as a state of Iowa scholar to be an uh, electronics systems engineer. That was my goal. And Jim gave me that verse. And it's one of the first things God used to get through my thick skull. Because I began to, began to think a little bit about that. About... Sometime in early July, my family went to Canada to a camping convention. It used to be a big organization, I don't know if it's still around or not, called the National Campers and Hikers Association, NCHA. And they had conventions all over America, and we went to the one that they had in Brantford, Ontario, Canada. And that first night we were there, they had a teen area which was probably about as big as this room and full of a bunch of teens. And they had a stage that was about the size of our sound booth. And I don't know why, but they were doing some kind of fashion show that went south on them. And you could see through some of the clothes and it was really, it was not, not pretty. And the weird part was, I normally probably wouldn't have cared but I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at that, and all of a sudden, my eyes are open to sin. 
to what sin looked like. My eyes were open. And I bowed my head and I said, God, what do you want me to do? And I heard the voice turn to me. What amazes me is when I relate this story, even though I had been under conviction in at least two churches, had been witness to at, the, at work, I still didn't know what to do. I mean, God tells me, turn to me. Well, why do I do that? What do I do? And I, so what I decided to do was my, by this time, my sister was going to that Christian Union church out in the country with, with Mike. And as soon as I got home, I got out of the car and Pam had not gone with us to Canada. Uh, I said to Pam, I want to go to church with you tonight. And I, her eyes got wide open. <laughs> like, uh, you do? <laughs> anyway, I went to church that night at that church. I have no idea what the preacher said. I have no idea what the sermon was. Don't remember a single thing about it. All I remember was I was ready to go forward and get saved. That's all I remember of that night. And I got... I got up from that altar at 10 minutes after 9, and I knew that I was a Christian at that point. I knew that I had given my life to Jesus Christ. And that did change my life, because I didn't go to Iowa State University. I went to Southwest Baptist University, because that's where all these people from the Christian Union Church were going. They were all going to Southwest. So I said, okay, I'll change and go to Southwest Baptist University. Well, that was a big change for me, too. Uh, I'd never been on a Christian college campus before, and, you know, I was a brand new Christian. I had to kind of learn Christianese and all the, <laughs> how, how I was supposed to act and all those kinds of things. Um, but I survived. I survived that first semester. And I met this wonderful lady over here. Uh, <laughs> she's mine <laughs> but uh, and, and that became uh, my future as well but it's so interesting to see where God took me from that point it's a little bit more of my testimony yeah I got saved in 1971 on July 19th but God then called me to preach in the spring of 1972, and I wasn't quite sure what I was supposed to be doing, because I knew I didn't want to be a pastor. Um, and then I heard about Christian broadcasting in one of my classes, and thought, that was, that's, that was kind of cool. And then I also liked the Bible study, the deep Bible study, digging into all these things, and I thought, well, maybe I'll just be a professor, a Christian Bible professor in some Christian college. And so that was kind of where, when we went off to seminary in 1975, that's, that was my goal, was to go get my master's and then go ahead and get my doctorate and preach. But God changed all of that about halfway through, what, my first year or second year? I, was, I guess it was probably the second year. Watching 700 Club with Pat Robertson. Alice and I had the same lunch hour, so we would come home and Pat Robertson was on the local TV station and we would watch the 700 Club, and, and God just really impressed upon me how many people could be reached through broadcasting, through, you know, look what we're doing here today. I mean, it's a long time since, and here we're in our church broadcasting on, on TV and online. Uh, but I watched Pat Robertson give an invitation on the TV, and I said, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. But guess what? That's not what God had for me. Because <laughs> I tried for nine months to get a job in the TV room, the TV and film world, and the audiovisual room, and I, I never did get a job there. Came back here to Missouri, 1978, and I worked construction for 
three weeks. That's all I could stand. <laughs> and I had a, Alice's cousin was dating, I think. I don't even know if they were engaged at this point, but there was a, a gentleman, Tim Mensending, who uh, was working at KRMS as a salesperson, local radio station here at the Lake of the Ozarks, KRMS. He said, you, he called me up and he said, Jim, hey, the guy in the afternoon is going to Wentzville to work on the radio station there, and that means, and the guy in the evening is going to move up to afternoons. That means there's an opening. You should come out and apply today. And so I did. And I got hired. Uh, and so I was on the air for a year doing evenings at uh, KRMS until I got a job in Christian Radio down in Texas. Took my wife and our brand new four-month-old baby away from her grandma Away, away from her family, and uh, there were tears, but uh, we went to a little town of Gilmer, Texas, where I worked for KHYM, uh, did news in the morning and then uh, afternoons. They transferred me up to a station in Iowa in about six months. I went to Dubuque, Iowa, managed a Christian radio station in Dubuque for about two and a half years until the owners decided to go country with it. And I said bye, and we came out down here to the lake, and I hadn't been here two weeks until somebody came up and said, why don't we start a Christian station here at the lake? And eventually that's where it happened, and God, this is where God had me, was here to do a Spirit FM and to touch hundreds of thousands of lives over the course of 38, 39 years. And it's, uh, it's been a good ride. I retired here last year, uh, but I'm still doing some broadcasting uh, uh, through Elevate Worship. And our Connect Media Ministries is just getting under, uh, underway and looking at doing some things uh, to help. Uh, we got a request for some help to build a tower right on the border of Mexico and, and the U.S. in Rio Grande City for a Christian radio station to reach the teenagers down there because the teenagers, believe it or not, there don't speak the Spanish. They speak English. And, but they're all the Christian radio stations are all Spanish-speaking stations down there. So this guy wants to, to put on a station for teenagers. So we may help them. I'm not sure what all we're going to do yet. With all that said, you know where I am. You know where I've come from, and you know where God has brought me to today. And I'm so thrilled that I get to do what I get to do in running the sound system and, and helping the technology here. Uh, there's still things I want to do. I want to change out these old lights, for one thing, <laughs> one of these days. Um, I'd love to see um, a big old LED wall here on the back, but uh, that's another you know, $10,000 or $100,000 we don't have. No, actually, they don't really cost as much anymore. They, you can get them for about twelve or 15000 There are lots of things I think we can still do um, to make our broadcast online something that people tune into every week. And we already know that there are more people watching us somewhere on that video than in this room. Now, it may not be in right this very second live, but over the course of the next six months, more people will watch us on, on video than are in our church building. That's a challenge for us. It's an opportunity for us to tell people about the gospel. And that's what today, that's what my message has been about. It has not been, you know, a message of going from verse to verse, but it has been a, a message to challenge you to go write out your testimony. Find a point of reference. Find something that you uh, would love to talk about and can relate to your life. Deal with the problem. Find out how, how did you find out that you had a problem, a sin problem? How did you find out 
that there was a solution, Jesus. And what made you make that decision to follow God? What caused you to get to that point where you yes said yes to God? That's your testimony. Write it out. Tell as many people as you get an opportunity to. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony of where I came from to where I am today. It's all because of you. And I thank you for the privilege of, uh, of serving you for so long and being able to touch lives. But I want others to, do, to experience that. Maybe not the way I have, but I just want everybody in this room to experience the joy of sharing their faith with someone else. I pray that you'll give us more and more opportunities to do so here at WOW. Bless us this day, and we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.